Good morning. To those of you who are here in person, welcome home. It is wonderful to see you. To anyone visiting us today, dare I say welcome to your new home. And to everyone joining us on Facebook and to our church website, welcome to you also. This is the only one of our three services that will be broadcast today, so hopefully it's the best of the three. To so those of you who were seated in places you don't normally sit, uh, perhaps split up, perhaps you're looking at the pulpit and the altar from a completely different angle today compared to previous weeks or years, um, if you think you are slightly put out by all this, look on the bright side. Some of the people here have to listen to my sermon three times today. If that isn't cruel and unusual punishment, I don't know what is. So if you only have to listen to it once, you are blessed among the people. Poor Michael and all of our welcome team have to do it three times. So, spare a prayer for them. And I hope that compensates for any odd feeling you had being seated and spaced apart. As you came in the, the sanctuary today, you'll see the basket uh, that you can drop your collection in. If you missed it on the way in, you can drop it on the way out. And dare a Scotsman even say this, if you really enjoyed the worship and want to chip in a little extra on the way out, feel free. However, if you didn't like the sermon, you can't take your money back. No refunds. Please remember to register each week for worship. Um, the online system is too complicated to, to go for months in advance. And so you can register again for next week from 9 o'clock tomorrow onward. Maybe we'll figure out a better system as we go, but this is the first time we've done this. And I think we're doing pretty well for first timers. So re-register for your preferred service starting at 9 o'clock tomorrow. And wear face masks at all times. If you're the kind of person that finds it difficult to breathe wearing the face mask, that's probably a sign from God that you should not be here in person yet and should be watching at home where you're safer. And let me lastly say to people um, who are a little uncomfortable coming today but did it anyway, or to those watching at home and thinking, should I go back to worship in person? If in doubt, no. We love you. We love you so much that we beg you to stay home where you're safe and to get well and to build up your immune system and to become healthier before you come back to worship with us in person. You have my permission to stay at home. In fact, call me and I'll give you that permission in writing if necessary. But you're welcome back when you're healthy and it's safe for you to be here. Until then, we look forward to you joining us online, live or after the event. And now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship. Oh, oh, oh. 
please die. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that, overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. What a treat to be back. They're all looking good. As far as people I can see. I would expound, but that's Ken's job in a little bit. And we're on a time schedule, right? Okay. So let's turn to Scripture. First reading is from the book of Exodus. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. 
Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. The word of the Lord. second reading is from the fifth chapter of the book of Romans, and what a powerful passage this is. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. So perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Then Jesus summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over all unclean spirits 
to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals, or a staff, or laborers deserve their food. Whatever town and village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, and if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking within you and through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and put them to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So I confess to you that I would not have noticed verse 36 in any other year. I would probably have dwelt upon the disciples being told, don't take spare sandals with you. I, I might have focused on the, if no one welcomes you, then shake the dust off your sandals. We live in Florida. We know what it's like to shake dust off of our sandals or flip-flops. I probably wouldn't have preached on take no money for being a minister of the gospel because that would have been really awkward for me the next time the budget was done. And someone in the annual meeting of the congregation would have stood up and said, let's not pay Pastor Ken anything. You're not meant to pay someone to be a minister of the gospel. So I probably wouldn't have even mentioned that one in passing. But verse 36 jumps out at this time in this place. Jesus sees the condition of people. He's not testing what way the wind blows. He's not gathering together a focus group to discover what's popular and what's not. He's not drawing up a strategic plan. He's certainly not forming a committee to figure out what to do. He's focused on nothing except the condition of the people he sees. He is moved with compassion. The Greek is a sort of, if I say movement of the bowels, will you not snigger? Thank you. If you are sniggering, I can't hear it behind the mask. It, it's a sort of stomach-churning compassion. It's not an, oh, look at the poor creature. It's to the very core of his being, which the ancients believed were the bowels. Stomach-churning, bowel-moving, visceral response in the depth of Jesus, to the condition of the people he sees. And he can't help but love them. And he can't help but love them by serving them. And serving them means being with them and curing them. Calling them to repentance and restoring them to community and to life. And by doing that, he embodies, he lives out, he demonstrates before everyone's eyes 
what the kingdom of God looks like is more powerful than any sermon or Bible study or adult group. It's a living, breathing, embodied in flesh, acting out in the world for the sake of the world, demonstration of what the kingdom of God looks like and feels like and sounds like. But in verse 36, what jumped out at me was harassed and lost. I don't think the word was lost. Let me just for once in my life refer to my notes. Harassed and helpless, or harassed and helpless. We'll discuss the emphasis on the syllable in that word. Harassed and helpless. Helpless is a word in Greek that means to lie prostrate. So it also means in Greek to be thrown to the ground. And that word harassed, in Greek it has thousands of meanings. It can, it can be harassed all the way from tortured to death to just mildly put out. But it's often the word that's used for to be oppressed. So harassed and helpless could also mean to be oppressed and thrown to the ground. If ever there was a phrase for our time, for a time of COVID, for a time of lawful demonstration, for a time of exercising First Amendment rights and freedoms in peace and without violence. If there was a time when we know what it is to be sick or to be fearful, even if we're strong and young, COVID strikes fear into our hearts, then this is a phrase for our time. To be oppressed and thrown to the ground. And seeing that, Jesus discovers, sees before his own eyes that this people are lost because they are sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus, as we know, spoiler alert for those of you who have not read that part of the gospel, Jesus is the good shepherd. There, I've ruined the whole message for you. It turns out it's Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, there's something we know about shepherds. They care for their whole flock without exception. Shepherds don't wander around the flock saying, I like you and you. That's actually a play on words if you see that as he uh, Never mind. It's a, it's a long walk to get us to tell a lousy joke. Um, Jesus, a shepherd doesn't say, oh, I like that sheep, that, that, that lamb's pretty nice. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I didn't mean to be pointing at you guys when I said that. It's not even a Freudian slip. The shepherd loves and cares for the whole flock. Every single sheep, without exception. But have you noticed what the good shepherd does? And this is familiar for every kid from Sunday school up from 9 to 90 or, or 103. The shepherd, the good shepherd, will think nothing of leaving the 99 sheep to go search for the one that's lost. At that moment, that one that's lost has the whole heart and mind of Jesus. He doesn't hate or dislike the 99 righteous, but the shepherd sees that that one sheep needs him. And, and how do you characterize that one sheep? The one sheep is lost and alone. The one sheep is without the flock, without the community. That sheep, that one sheep is in danger. Nobody hears the bleeding of that one sheep. And so the good shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and searches out the one that is lost. Now scripture tells us what those lost sheep look like, especially in Matthew's gospel. They're characterized in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who mourn. All those people that the world doesn't particularly care about. And you and I read and think, well, what's blessed about that? And we discover they're blessed by God. Matthew's Gospel is also the one in which we hear the story of the sheep and the goats. When was it we didn't feed you, clothe you, give you water, care for you, when you didn't do it for the least of these? When was it that we loved the lost and the hungry and the thirsty and the imprisoned, when you did it for the least of these? You did it for me. 
we get a sense in Scripture. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. We get a sense in Scripture what the lost are like. In the Old Testament, you've heard me preach on this before, it's the quartet of the vulnerable. Over and over and over. I don't just mean cherry-picked once or twice in the Old Testament. I mean throughout the prophets and the Old Testament, you see the same quartet of the vulnerable. The same people who are little and lost and least. The widows, the orphans, the aliens in your land, and the crippled and maimed. And why are they so vulnerable? Let's not focus on who they are. Why are they vulnerable? They're vulnerable because they have no one to speak up for them. They have no one to love them or care for them. They have no community because the widow has lost her husband, the orphan parents, the alien is a stranger in a strange land with no friends and no kin, and the crippled and the maimed have been excluded from society because they are crippled and maimed, and it was a very superstitious society. So never mind who the sheep are at the moment, I'm sure we can all gather and have great fun naming who we think they are or who we think they're not. But Scripture tells us in a powerful description who they are. They are voiceless. They are excluded. They are alone. They have no community and no support. And yes, from time to time they might found their voice and be noisy, but when the noise dies down, they're forgotten again. Yes, they may have rights, they may be enfranchised, but some of those rights are pretty new. And what's only just been given to you can quite easily be taken from you. So we know who the vulnerable are. And our Savior has shown his willingness as the Good Shepherd to leave the 99 and go find them and love them. We know that our Savior has demonstrated what the kingdom of God looks like. It looks like healing. It looks like love. It looks like solidarity. It looks like restoration. It looks like welcoming back. It looks like including. It looks like bringing in. It looks like leaving our comfort zone and entering into places of danger. It looks like becoming the laughing stock of our family and friends and everyone whose opinion we hold dear. It looks like us being excluded too because we are included by Jesus. It looks like a multiplicity of ways to love and to serve. But it begins not with family and kin. It begins not with people who like us. It begins not with people who look like us or agree with us. It looks like the little and the lost and the least being given the love and respect that their creator, redeemer, and sustainer shows for them. And we then do likewise. And it is a word of hope to the lost when we are the lost, when we are the little, when we are the least, when we are the oppressed, and it's a word of life to those who are utterly convinced that people like us can't even see them, let alone love them. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. Amen.
together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. In the name of the Holy Spirit, Please be seated. Pastor Wogan, please come forward to lead us in prayer. Although I warn you, it's a trap. Today, to the day, is the 50th anniversary of Pastor Wogan's ordination. Tom. Tom has one minute. So I'm honored to be here this morning as a member of the church, a member of the church council, and as a friend of Pastor Rogan. To be able to present him this morning a certificate from the Synod commemorating his 50 years of service as a pastor. The 50 years of service as a pastor, to put that into perspective, that's 600 months, that's 2,600 weeks. That's 18,250 days. That is a lifetime of service. Ephesians 4 tells us that Jesus gave the church the gift of pastors to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church and Christ's body. Pastor Rogan, you have spent a lifetime <coughs> doing exactly that. You have always done it with a heart for Christ and for Christ's people. So today, we want to thank you for your faithful service. We want to thank you for your tireless devotion. You have touched the lives of tens of thousands of people. And you can't acknowledge the past for 50 years without acknowledging his work. We also thank Sandy for her service. So I sat down yesterday. And I wanted to come up with a few descriptions of how people looked at you, how I felt about you. And it didn't take me two hours, it only took me two minutes. Because you're humble, you're a man of wisdom, you're compassionate. You're gentle, you're thoughtful, you're patient, you're sincere, you're gracious, you're non-judgmental, you're loving, you're affectionate, and you're funny. You love to joke, you love to laugh. I always enjoy your company. And your Christian faith, faith is at the center of everything you do. So congratulations on a job that you have done well and continue to do well. God bless you on your journey forward. of prayer. I think I need a chair. I'm not sure who he was describing, but uh, I'm grateful for the thoughts that he shared. 50 years go by in a hurry. Some of you know that. Some of you will discover that. I give thanks to God for the privilege of being a pastor. I give thanks to God for opportunity to face each new day. I give thanks to God for those who lead the church have carried on the mantle that the rest of us have tried our best to pass along. And I give thanks to God for each and every one of you. Without you, there is no church. We are the church together. Called into unity with one another in the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith, following the examples of Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, and the teacher of Macrina, all of whom we commemorate on this day. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. 
where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all forced to leave their homes. Hear us, O God. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Especially we pray this day for David Bart, Jack Bill, Thomas Bone, Lorraine Boggs, Denise Collins, Georgia Cotter, Charlene Parv, Nancy Hargrave, Cal and Joanne Fox, Wayne Kafler Sr., Peggy Lawrence, Annie Liz Scott, Wilma Lynch, Benjamin Mouse, Sam Myers, Ann Mongillo, David Moore, Carrie Morrison, Emily Nowakowski, Juan Restrepo, Barbara Russell, Mary Ann Shute, Daniel Silva, Iga Steyer, Casey Taylor, Barbara Keller, Alexandra Zalik, Veronica Zalik, and others we name now in our hearts. Feed all who hunger, empower all whose voices go unheard, and help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation, that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work, that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O God. Holy One, we call on your spirit of restoration. For all who have contracted coronavirus, we pray for caring and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who experience fear or anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. Hear us, O God. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us, those we know well. Sustain us in your mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in life. Hear us, O God. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. 
gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Please be seated. if you would remain seated and the ushers will dismiss you from the back to the front if you return to your cars or go to the circle whatever you're doing next uh, please be guided down the hallway through the fellowship hall and out the fire door that takes you to the parking lot go in peace christ is with you Thank you to God. Oh, you